Welcome everybody to chapter 11 of the NASM Essentials of Personal Fitness Training Manual, you know, reference here. We're looking at, you know, chapter 11 again today, and this is going to be about um, the true start of assessment. All right. Assessment being critical for many different things, including, you know, being able to find a baseline for everything. You find your baseline and then you move forward. So we're talking here about the health, wellness and fitness parts of everything. Chapter 12 will expand upon this a little bit more, get a little bit more into the performance side of everything. So let's start here and let's rock and roll through this. So again, with anything else, we're trying to, you know, again, we're trying to find this baseline that we're talking about. But again, trying to find any risk that might be there, any inherent risk that might be there, like it says, of cardiovascular, pulmonary, or metabolic diseases, um, signs and symptoms, anything like that. If any of that is present at that point, yeah, we need to make sure that we get, you know, doctor orders to, you know, clear or, you know, it, it could be a lot more challenging. Also with assessments, we're looking at that, that underlying word right there, contraindications, aspects that will not allow you to complete a specific movement. Right, that's what a contraindication is, something that goes against what you should be doing. Um, you know, so again, not just physical contraindications, but also medical contraindications. So it could be anything from a previous injury to a medication that you might be on. It just depends on what it is that you're actually, you know, working with in that moment. All right. So um, also we want to make sure that we're not basically doing too much more, you know, too much work for what we're trying to achieve. All right. And by that, you know, unwarranted medical evaluations, you know, if we don't need to do those and, and, and we can avoid it at all costs, then we will. Um, we also want to make sure that we get that those recommendations for an initial, you know, set of activities that someone can do. So, again, finding that baseline, what we're going to do is be able to give out information to the client and to ourselves to then prep them for what what is going to be coming up, what level they're going to start at, um, if they've come with previous experience, if they have never worked out before, you know, anything along those lines. Also making sure about what, you know, they know about their current condition. We can educate our people about what they are currently working with because that's really critical. Sometimes we don't educate our people enough to, you know, to where they are currently. Um, again, the program evaluation, if we don't do follow-up types of things, we can't evaluate how that program is working and what we need to do. And then lastly, you know, this, the, the, the assessment can actually help with goal setting. If you see where you're currently at, it makes it easier to set something moving forward and not be too unrealistic with that one, especially when we start talking about SMART goals. So the first step in the assessment process typically is your pre-participation screenings. That's basically before you start doing any movements, you're going to determine where these people's level of health are. All right. So typically we would do things like uh, health history questionnaires. We would do things like par cues. And these are going to give us a screen to see um, where certain conditions are, if that person's healthy, if they need any additional medical advice. You know, we're just trying to get more from them from that. It's not overly detailed. We're just trying to get as much information as we can without like overwhelming them. So the, the first one here we talked about is a PARQ, a, phys a physical, wow, a physical activity readiness questionnaire or what we call a PARQ. Now, there's a PARQ plus that goes on to be a little bit longer than this that has a little bit more detail. Now, this right here, um, the regular standard PARQ has been around for a while. If you looked, it says, you know, 2011. Uh, it's a very simple seven question, yes or no style. And if you answer yes to any of those questions, then we need to be able to figure out what needs to happen next. Now, typically, this was the standard. PARQ was just the standard. And it was a yes and no, yes and no, yes and no for seven different options. If you answered yes, then typically you had to go and get medical clearance by a physician or you know your primary care, whoever it may be. And then from there, what you would end up with is um, you know that clearance to get them to start working here. A PARQ plus, all right. A PARQ plus has an additional set of circumstances that come after it, where you're going to answer a lot of different questions. Okay, and so because of that, you end up with. Um, a lot more detail, especially if they did answer yes on certain parts. If they answer no, then there isn't really, you don't necessarily have to move on to that 
plus part of the par queue. So that's also an option as well. But sometimes that plus part can be good for even the healthier people because it shows you, you know, a lot more detail in terms of, well, um, you know, anything from, you know, where, where they're currently at health wise to there might be one little thing in there that might not be too important, but it might be something that could be worked on as a goal later on. So the second part that we want to refer to is a health history questionnaire. Okay, now a part Q is very cut and dry. All right, yes and no's. And then again, if you have to, you can move to the second part of everything. And that would help you to be able to determine uh, where you should be starting at, where you need to keep moving through. Now a health history questionnaire is exactly that. We're getting your history. This is kind of along the lines of what you might find at like a doctor's office. Um, it's, it's one of those things where you're going to get more information out of somebody just because we want to be more clear about who they are as a person. So the, the clearer the, you know, the clearer the picture that we can paint, the better off we are when it comes to that. Okay. And that's really going to be, um, of, of utmost importance at that part, at that point. Okay. Now the health, health history questionnaire, again, age, gender, height, weight, you know, very demographic style information they give, you know, and then some emergency contacts. So that's always very important just in case, just in case something happens. Then we get into more lifestyle based types of things and then medical history as well. Now, all of those really, again, give you that most, the most amount of detail for what we're trying to achieve at that point. Okay. So you've done this. Okay, you've gone through, you've taken care of the paperwork side of everything, and, and we all have our opinion about paperwork and everything like that, but it's important. It really is because if you don't have the details and you don't have the information that will help you support those details, then it's, it's, it makes it more challenging when someone's like, oh yeah, by the way, I had a heart attack two years ago and I'm minimized on you know, what I can and cannot do in my workouts. Well, if that's the case, you could have figured that out you know, a while ago and, and, and saved yourself a lot of time. So that's why we do these things up front. It's not just to just do paperwork and, and make everybody's lives really frustrating. It's just, that's the way that it needs to be is that we have to get all that info up front so we can make a better choice later on. So really what we want to think about here when we're doing these are there's four major things. There's relevance, appropriateness, validity, and reliability. Now really quickly kind of hitting on those things, Relevance is, you know, is it relevant? Is it associated with the topic that we're talking about? You know, is it relevant to what, you know, is it basically trying to, to do what we want it to do? And is it relevant to the person? Meaning, does it hold meaning? All right. Uh, is it appropriate? You know, pretty straightforward. You know, is it appropriate? Are we giving the right assessments for the right things? You know, is it really appropriate? Validity means that, you know, what is, whatever we decide to do for testing, is it valid? Meaning that is it aimed to test what it's meant to test? Okay, so if you're, if you're eventually gonna give somebody a one and a half mile run test, that's a valid test. That means it's gonna aim to measure your cardiorespiratory fitness, okay? That's just one example. Now, reliability, on the other hand, is, is it repeatable? So a lot of times we wanna stick with assessments that we know that we can repeat especially if we're going to do things like follow-ups and pre post tests and things like that, because that's hyper critical because that means that we can repeat it and it doesn't have to require 19 different steps that if you mess one step up, you're in trouble. Okay. Um, now there are specifics that we really want to make sure that we pay attention to. And this is definitely something that's most likely going to end up on a test of some sort. All right. We want to make sure, that we do all of the very static types of things first before we get into the physical part of anything. So things like resting heart rate, blood pressure, and body composition testing, which will be discussed in chapter 12 you know, in more detail, those are things that we wanna do first because if we do them after exercise, obviously our resting heart rate isn't gonna be true. Our blood pressure is going to be off and actually it'll affect your body composition more than you actually you know, think it may. So um, especially if you have a certain type of equipment that you use as well, like if you use like a BIA, a bioelectrical impedance um, analyzer, that, that can skew you because you become dehydrated and it can throw off your numbers. So really, 
anything that is non-physical exertion would come first. And then after that, we would also we would then go into the things that we would test for aerobic conditioning, strength, and power. Okay, so it would go, you know, static and then move it into our dynamic assessments that are, you know, again, I say static, but we understand that we're saying non-exercise and exercise-based assessments. So the non-exercise-based ones come first because they can be skewed by the exercise. Okay, so, you know, again, with those assessments, we want to make sure that, you know, we're within our implications of safety and of legality. Okay, we have to make sure that we are, you know, again, aware that those things must be, you know, must be part of the process. So with our assessment, you know, are we CPR and AED certified? Now, as a trainer and as someone who's going to be in this field, it's going to be your job and your duty, depending upon, because I know people are going to be in all different places, you know, whatever state you live in, whatever town, whatever city, you need to find out what your requirements are for AEDs. And that's really important because AEDs are not 100% necessary. And I say this meaning by law. The, the law does not require that an AED be on premise at a fitness location. Now, I know in your head you're going, are you crazy? Yeah, I mean, it, to me, I find that to be really, really kind of a crazy statement that I have to say. but. Lately, there have been some laws and some some legal points that have been changing. So that's why I said, wherever you live, make sure you find out what your AED laws are, because, you know, if you are not AED certified and you need to be, then that can cause liability. OK. So that's the safety and legal points. Now, with the exercise test termination, the bottom line here is that you need to be aware of any signs or symptoms of negativity. And if that person tells you they are done, stop test at all times. That's the main point there. If there's a problem and you have to terminate a test and then there's a complication, then you would need to say to that person that they would need to get medical clearance before we can proceed. Okay. That's, that's really important because if we don't do that, then we're setting our people up for failure and we're setting them up to potentially have a catastrophic problem, which could ultimately result in death if we don't take care of it. I know I go to the very top of the ladder there when I talk about morbid things, but we have to be, you know, this is a, this is a bottom line truth factor is that if we don't take care of that situation, we could potentially hurt somebody or kill someone. So it's very important that they get medical clearance. So your assessment instructions are very cut and dry. You know, uh, make sure you communicate with your people beforehand. Make sure you know to let them know they have to wear proper clothing. You know, don't have heavy foods too close to this avoid smoking and alcohol beforehand avoid caffeine three hours before and avoid strenuous activity the day before that and what that does it'll give your body like almost like a healed kind of a, a presence so that when you do your your blood pressure your heart rate and your body comp you're not having skewed data all right so um, again, if, but also if we go back over here and I'll kind of blow this up a little bit for us in this manner because we already went through the information, but I'll kind of pull it up a little bit wider. Here's some things that we want to pay attention to. Um, and this this is be um, relating to the exercise termination criteria with this information. OK, these are eight guidelines that you want to pay attention to um, any chest pain, any uh, an angina type symptoms. If blood pressure starts to fall, if you're taking blood pressure, if you exceed blood pressure when it's not supposed, if you exceed a blood pressure of 250 um, or exceeding 115, depending upon what that person's doing at any point in time, um, any unusual, like weird fatigue, like out of nowhere, you know, if all of a sudden, like this is like kind of like all of a sudden types of things. Um, if you notice that, you know, poor blood supply to the face, meaning that if you start realizing they get white in the face, they start feeling like clammy and cold. Um, if they start feeling nauseous, we're done. Dizziness, confusion, all of that type, sharp leg pains or cramps, we don't want. And then again, like I said before, if they ask to stop, then we, we will stop it for them. Okay. So I, sorry, I, I missed that on the first go around, but I want to make sure we hit on those because those are 
termination criteria, and we would take care of that immediately. So again, with uh, this is where we get a little um, more specific here, working on fitness assessment protocols. If you look, we're talking about heart rate and using manual measurement. Now we can use, we could have somebody sit for five minutes quietly and then have them get a read on maybe something like an Apple watch or a Fitbit or something like that. We can do those types of things. We can do a true 60 second count, but if we really wanted to cut it, we could always go 10 seconds and then, you know, multiply that by 60. All right. Or you could go six seconds and multiply it by 10 and that would just put the, but again, we want to be as accurate as possible. So a 60 second measurement is always your best bet. Now they want you to be taking this at your radial artery. And if you notice there are two fingers on the thumb side, thumb side is your radius. All right. And if you can do it for a complete 60 seconds, go for it. All right. Um, little bit different here they really you know nasm is really big on taking it at the at the radial artery because you know what they're saying is that if you do it at the carotid artery which is in your neck although it's a very accurate read if you apply too much pressure to the neck what they're saying is that that can eventually cause constriction of that artery and because of that it could cause complications with your heart rate and your blood pressure because you're pushing too hard to find that pulse so that's just something to be aware of, and that's why they recommend going to the radial artery. Blood pressure. Blood pressure, there's your levels on the bottom there, normal being one less than 120 over 80. Okay. Now, systolic blood pressure, what we're saying here is systolic blood pressure is the contraction part of the left ventricle. So when your left ventricle contracts and the pressure that's forcing the blood out into the aorta is found, that is your true systolic. It's the contraction phase of the heart, or, or particularly the left ventricle. Diastolic is that relaxative point of the left ventricle, which allows for that left ventricle to then relax and allow for the filling to occur, and that's your diastolic blood pressure, and that's typically your lowest, okay? Now, typically we would use a, you know, a traditional method here where we would use a what we call a sphygmomanometer or a pneumatic cuff. That's the two terms you hear, or a blood pressure cuff is a layman's term. Now, the, you know, with that cuff, you'd have your stethoscope, you'd have everything in alignment to that, to your, to the central region of your elbow, okay, in that anatomical position. And then we would go through the motions of pumping up um, typically about 20, you know, basically about 20 millimeters of mercury over you know, where, but typically it's 180. Okay. Now this is just, you know, generalized, you'd pump it up to 180, but if someone's hypertensive, we'd have to go a little bit higher than that because we need to be able to catch that number. Okay. So this is something that you will definitely need to practice, um, at some point getting used to trying manual pressure. And hopefully you'll get that on the job training for depending upon where you work at, because if you work at more of a clinical type of setting, that's where you're definitely going to need to know it. If you're going to work more um, at like a you know a, a, like a gym or a studio, you may not have to. But you also need to know that if you're using automated blood pressure cuffs, you still have to find the alignment of the cuff to your artery. Okay, so it's very important to understand that. Now there's you know again your levels. You'll see here you know hypertensive crisis. Anything from over 180 to over 120. Now it's it's and or in this situation. <clears throat> so if you look at stage one hypertension, 139 to one, 130 to 139, and then it's 80 to 89. Here's where it gets, you know, where you can't let yourself get confused. If the blood pressure that you have is 138 over 78, well, technically that is stage one hypertension if it's constant and chronic, because that upper systolic number is still high, whereas the diastolic may be under the right point, but but it's still, it's, it still doesn't matter because the systolic supersedes that or vice versa. You might be 128 over 88, but that diastolic is high for that moment, you know, or that chronic condition. And that's where you end up having those concerns. So from, again, moving from our heart rate, our blood pressure into our body comp, there are a bunch of different ways that we can worry about what we call anthropometry 
or uh, body comp itself. Now, the first you know, of these is more about less measurement, more about number, which is BMI. Okay, BMI doesn't actually physically take measurements. Well, it does, but it doesn't. It takes your height and your weight into consideration. Now, those are generalized measurements, whereas, you know, circumference, again, that's getting more specific to where you got to go. Skin fold testing is where you truly pinch skin at certain positions. And then BIA is nodes or nodes placed on the body that allow electrical current to pass through them, or like what you might know, where you step on like a scale that has like a four point contact like an in-body um, that would give you a readout. And then you also have underwater weighing, again, less common for us, but you know something that is an alternative and a little bit more pricey. So uh, body mass index, make sure that you can figure out your own. Now, figuring out your own is BMI equals 703 times your weight in pounds divided by your height in inches squared. So if you had a person who was, you know, just say 200 pounds, right? And they were, we'll just say 65 inches, which is five, five, five. Okay. That's, that's, again, this is just throwing random numbers out there. What you would do is you would go 703 times 200, which is their pounds. Okay. And you would take those and do those first. So we'll make the parentheses here. You would do those first and then you would divide it by 65, but it would be squared. Whoops. Let's do this right. Whoops. So it would be 65 squared, which we can even do this. So for whatever reason, this is being funny. All right, here we go. So now we can do 65 squared. So if we were to do our calculations really quick, 703, 703 times 200 gives us a grand total of 140,000. This is where it gets funny. Um, we go 140,600 divided by, and then 65 squared is... 4,225, and we take those two numbers, we divide them by each other, and we would get a grand total of 33, and we'll go to two decimal places, 0.28, okay? Now this person right here, based on these calculations, we'll bold them up, okay, and we'll make them a little bit bigger. That right there, 33.8, we would take that and move this over to our chart, and say, okay, a 33.28, that would be high disease risk. It's a high BMI. Their classification is obese category or obese classification number one. All right, so that's how we would determine our number there. So it's 703 times someone's weight divided by their height squared. You have to remember that squared part right here um, in this moment because this is gonna be critical to your number, because if not, you're gonna get some really high number and it's not gonna to match to what you're looking at, okay? So that's how we would determine BMI. It's just a ratio of your weight to your height. And that ratio gives you an indicator to your disease risk and your classification of, you know, basically obesity, overweightness, or normal or underweight. Now, again, for a, an athlete, if you're working with athletes, this, or, or people who are high level exercisers, this may not be the best alternative for you. So you may wanna to try to find something different for that perspective, okay? So that's gonna be critical for us there. Now, you know, again, you take each of this with a grain of salt and we kind of go along with that. So, you know, if you're working with a generalized person, you know, meaning like someone who is not an athlete or a high level exerciser, then we would be saying that BMI can be a very valuable tool. Okay, not because of, you know, it's, we, we get a little nervous about it, but understand that it really does give you a good indication for what your height is versus your, your weight is versus your height. So, you know, again, that person goes from sedentary to active, we might start considering something different if they start gaining a lot of muscle mass. 
So for circumference measurements, if we're looking at things like, you know, waist and hip and thigh measurements, we have these basically patterns of fat distribution that we call them. They're called android and gynoid fat distribution patterns. And what it is, an apple shape is more of that central abdominal region fat, right? That's more of your apple. Um, you know, that can be a little bit more of an elevated health risk because anytime you have higher levels of abdominal fat, that puts you at a higher classification for disease risk. On the other hand, you have something called gynoid fat distribution, which is going to be found more in the hip and thigh region. And that's going to be what we would call your pear shaped apple. I know this is two ladies right here, but apple is traditionally more male based. Uh, gynoid or pear shaped is a little bit more female based just because females tend to carry their, their, their weight and their fat distributions a little bit more in their hips in their thighs, whereas males carry a little bit more in their abdomen. Not to say that other people can't have that, but that's just saying it's more relative to those individuals. So we go from there to, from these circumferences to waist circumference. Now, bottom line here, what we want to do is we want to position our person right in front of us. We want to have them turned so that they're, they're sideways to our forward facing, because what that does, it makes you see a clear, a clear vision of the tape going out and coming back toward you. From there, what we would do is we take that tape measure, we would put it around the waist and then where we would go, typically we would go now some, you know, here it says identify the narrowest point of the torso below the rib cage. For waist circumference, I usually err on the side of caution and go right above the belly button. So if someone takes and puts their finger, like if they're wearing clothes and they take their finger and put it into their belly button, my tape would go right above their finger. So again, for test taking purposes, this is what we would want to go by for real life. You know, we really want to kind of maybe go right above that belly button. Now, some things to understand males above a 40 inch and females above a 35 inch waist are again exposed to a higher level of disease risk. Now, and that goes down to that bottom chart. All right. If you know, again, if you're for a, a male, 39.3 to 47.2, you're high risk category for disease. So that's, that's, that's really important to understand. All right. Now how you measure, it can be centimeters, it can be inches, but you know, we, and not, no disrespect, but we are, we, in America, we go in inches, you know, if it had to be for another purpose, we could go in centimeters. Okay. Also with that waist circumference, we could then take it a little bit one step further and we would go waist to hip ratio, okay? And how we would do that, if we come down here, a true waist to hip, all right, a true waist to hip would be, just say that an individual's waist to hip ratio, they had a waist measurement of 34, and they had a hip measurement of 39, okay? The same thing would be here. It's a very quick measurement. A it would just take 34, and divide it by 39, all right, and then again, round it to two decimal places, and you would get a point or 0 0.87, okay? Now, this right here would be considered for, depending upon, again, if it's a male or a female, this is where it gets tricky, but we, I just threw out random numbers. If this was a male, they would actually be in the low health risk category, where if it was a female, they would actually place them in the high risk category. Now, the reason why typically is because females are, have that shorter, wider hip, you know, hip, hip, hip pelvis complex, whereas males tend to have taller, narrower. So that's why we have to take both genders into consideration when we talk about the differences in ratio. All right. So we have to, that's something that we have to pay attention to. It's not the same for both males and females because of that reason. Circumference measurements, there are a lot of them at the neck, the chest, the waist, the hips, the thighs, and the calf, okay? All of those are very, very important to, you know, for our location purposes. Now, um, we have to be able to, you know, know how to take the tape and place it correctly for this purpose. So what we want to do is we want to be able to... Um, take and look at 
where each one of those positions are. So if we pulled up chap if you went to your book and you went into chapter 11, I have the online access here, but if you go into chapter 11 and we go into the body composition, we can start right here and look, there is your neck measurement. So again, right around the Adam's apple is really what we want to consider for this. Okay. As we move through that chest region, see the fullest part of the chest, a lot of individuals will say it's nipple height, but it, you can make it a lot easier on yourself and go to the widest point. So there, there can be some liability with this as well. So, you know, depending upon, you know, if you're a male or a female, I know it sounds crazy, but we have to be very cognizant of how to measure. Um, typically what I tell new people that are learning how to measure, like if I'm like, I'm a guy and if I'm measuring a female, what I do is I say, okay, what I want you to do is take this tape and just place it over your, your chest region. And I, but I want it nipple height. And so what I do is I say, okay, you have it there, hold it for me. And then I pull and I say, okay, are you let go? Yes. Then we got it good to go. Okay. That alleviates any sort of unwanted um, or uncomfortable feelings of, you know, of, of having to touch certain regions and everything like that. Again, this is a training video. So the aspect here is to train you on the do's and don'ts of everything as well. So it's one of those things that we, we definitely want to pay attention to. So that's your chest point. Moving on into your waist. Again, the waist, right, this is below the rib cage and above the top of the hip bone. Um, again, I, again, the best point is just, again, have them point into their belly button and go right above that. That's usually the best way to indicate it. Your hips, very simple. If you look at the female here on the right, she is on the side of the individual and that's where you want to be set because again, you want to go around the widest point of the hip. Okay. Or, or basically your butt, your thigh, um, you know, with the thigh, largest circumference immediately below the gluteal fold. So what we're saying here is that basically where, not to be graphic, but where your butt cheek is into your thigh, that would be considered your gluteal fold. And the widest point after that is what we would want to look at. And that would be where you would measure from. Okay. Now, depending upon a person, usually it's pretty close to the center. Some people might be a little bit lower than that. So just be aware of where that location is. Calf is the same thing, widest point. Um, arm is the same point as well, fullest part, okay? All those are 100% necessary for the proper location. And you can, you know, as your own person, you can experiment a little bit more with that, but understand that these are things that are there for you and you can find other places to measure if you really wanted to. And there, you know, again, there's your, your waist, your hips, your thigh, your calves, and your arms. Um, and, and, you know, we, we know we're very specific on those regions. Now, skin fold testing, this takes a lot of practice. And, you know, again, this is going to be a lot of on-site training for some of you. Um, for, you know, for those that are in my class, we go through this during our assessment class. And we go through the right locations, how to fold correctly. But the main thing to understand here is that the better you are at skill at this, the better, the easier it becomes. It's easier just to go right through. Now, all those red landmarks are positions that we would have. And if you look at it, the way that it's positioned is the way that you'd want to pinch. Like if you look here, the tricep, that's a vertical fold, which means the, the fold itself goes up and down, which means you pinch horizontally to make a, ver a vertical fold. Um, I'm not usually a bicep. I don't usually do the bicep, but this is one that NASM says that is a, is a standard approach. Um, I chip, typically do the tricep more than I do the bicep. The chest is a diagonal fold. Now, if you notice here, men and women have slightly different locations, so pay attention to that. The abdomen has a vertical fold, okay? And the abdomen you'll see right in the middle here. If you look at the picture, um, you know, right in the middle by your belly button, it's up and down. Mid axillary, <clears throat> mid axillary, if you look at right below the chest, all right, in, it's like a triangle here, your bicep, your pec, and then that one right below, that's your mid axillary. What you wanna do with that is you take somebody and have them flex their shoulder to 90 degrees so their arm is straight up. And then what you would do is go right down, what the best case scenario is go right down from the armpit and where it intersects the nipple is where you would take that positioning from. Um, 
The subscapular region is on the back side. If you notice, it's the left one here on the back side. The right is obviously the tricep location. It's a diagonal fold. Basically, what you do is you would say, okay, hey, I'm going to just take my thumb and go down your shoulder blade. And what you do is you go, you run your thumb down the shoulder blade until it comes to the very bottom point of that medial line. And that right there will be what we would call the inferior angle, which is the lowest angle that you have. And then we take a diagonal fold from there. Superiliac is the left side of the abdomen. It's gonna be basically, again, you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna palpate your hip. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take your thumb and run it along the iliac crest or the highest point of your hip bone. And then you would go right in the middle of that and squeeze diagonally. And then lastly, your thigh on the bottom there on the left, that is gonna be your, your true vertical fold up and down, okay? So very good landmarks, very un, you know good to understand, but really bottom line here, the procedures on the left, everything gets taken on the right-hand side. That's the critical component here. We wanna make sure everything's done on the right-hand side. Um, you wanna make sure you take a minimum of two measurements. The, the way that I teach everybody is <clears throat> if you get, so you take a skin full measurement and it's 16. The second one you get, if it's 16, then you got 16 and 16, then we just move on because we got two of the same measurements for that site. If you got a 16, <clears throat> then a 17, you do a third one. And if it comes up 16 or 17, you would take the one that you got double of. If you got an 18 on that, which is kind of interesting, then you would just take the average of the three. Um, make sure you open up the jaws completely. Be meticulous. I am not, when I first started doing skin fold testing, I was not opposed to using a, I, I use the waterproof marker. Sometimes you can use a Sharpie. Um, just, you know, sometimes the Sharpie takes about a couple of days to wash off. But, you know, again, marking that because every time you wanna be, you wanna be vigilant, right? You wanna make sure that you're always meticulous and in the same spot each time. Um, don't do this after exercise, which we talked about. Um, you wanna make sure you let them know about the test so that they can wear appropriate clothing. And then, like it says here, avoid performing this for obese clients. And that's the bottom line because it's not gonna, this is an inaccurate test for those who are obese. Now, there are three different types. There's a seven site, three site, and four site. Now, the four site is probably a little bit more, it's obviously a little bit more accurate than the three site, but it's less accurate than the seven site. Seven site just takes a little while, especially if you're new at it. That's the main concern there. Okay, so pay attention to the, the locations here. Um, what you know, revert to your diagram here and your charts here to know where those locations are. And then from there, what you can do is you would plug it into a calculator and be able to determine what that percentage of body fat is. Now, there are online calculators you can use after you get your sum of your skin folds. Okay. But if you look here, you know, best used for clinical or athletic populations, Jackson and Pollock seven site. And the reason why is because Jackson and Pollock has a different equation than if, than if you went to the, like down on the bottom there, the Dernan and Wormsley, they have different equations that you'd have to plug into. BIA, again, we're measuring the amount of um, water versus fat. Water is a, um, water is what we would call a conductor. So that means that electricity can flow a lot better through, okay? So if we have more muscle, that means we have more body water, so therefore we would have lower fat percentage. So that's how that works. So again, that's where you would stand on like, you know, on specific nodes and you would have somebody be placed in a certain position so that they could ultimately, they are able to, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, they stand on the nodes and that electrical current is going through and what it is doing is is allowing you to see what the you know the conduction rate is and then it has an algorithm that you'd spit everything out on hydrostatic weighing the bottom line here is the more fat that you have on your system the more buoyant you are the less you would weigh underwater on the right hand side the more muscle mass you have the more you weigh underwater you're more like a brick and you're gonna sink more, so therefore you're gonna weigh more underwater. That's what we're looking for there. And just understand that with hydrostatic weighing, we're talking about Archimedes principle, which is basically that when you get down, you will displace water, all right, when you are fully immersed. So if you 
are more fat based, you're going to displace <clears throat> you're going to displace less water and it's going to make you weigh less underwater as well. So from there, what we can do is we can move from those to, a, you know, again, we move into a cardio based cardio respiratory assessment based assessment. Now we're measuring cardio respiratory fitness by, you know, understanding VO2 max or maximal cardiac uh, maximum oxygen consumption, excuse me. And that is where we would pay attention to all, you know, all of those parameters there. Now it says right here, you decrease by about 5% per decade and in fit individuals on your VO2 max. So again, whatever you have, you want to use because you don't want to lose it. So again, VO2 max is that total measurement of aerobic fitness. The higher the value, the healthier your heart, the healthier the interaction between your heart and your lungs. Okay. Now there is some equipment that you can use, but you can also do submaximal testing um, that can, you know, basically use an equation based on heart rate, okay, and some other factors as well. Now, ratings of perceived exertion are some ways that we can work on, you know, simple cardio, uh, cardiorespiratory tests. RPE is measured in a 6 to 20 scale, where a 6 refers to a 60 on the heart rate, and the 20 refers to a 200. Or you have a modified version, which is basically 1 to 10. And all of those have certain parameters that you can see on the right-hand side of what is considered very light, light, moderate, et cetera. Okay. But it's a subjective rating. You're telling me how I'm telling you how I feel. And by that I can see, okay, well, if that person says I feel really bad right now and they went five minutes on a treadmill, the goal is to build them up so that the next time you say, okay, when do you, you know, how, how are you doing right now? Oh, this is really, really very, very hard. And they went seven minutes. We know there's an improvement. Another test would be the YMCA three minute step test. It's a 12 inch box. We would go what we would call 98 beats per minute on a metronome and you can set that. I have an app on my phone that I use. They'll go for three minutes maintaining that up, up, down, down pace of the metronome. All right. And what you do is after that, once the, once the client is done, all right, they would sit and rest um, on a box and you would take their heartbeat for 60, you basically take their heart rate for 60 seconds. And at that point there, what you would do is find what their recovery heart rate is. And from there, you can determine based on their recovery heart rate, where they would be on this chart, if they were excellent or, you know, you know, were they excellent? Were they good, et cetera. Another one is a Rockport walk test, which again is a one mile walk test as quick as possible. The difference between walking and running, walking always has one foot in contact with the ground. Okay. No running or jogging is permitted. Okay. Um, that's the main thing. So trying to get it done as quick as possible is the bottom line there. And from there you can, you can measure how you are in terms of time based on your output here. Okay. Same thing with the one and a half mile run test. You know, again, same premise that now we can run jog or walk, but it's again, the fastest time possible. And there's your, where you would fall depending upon age. Okay. So those are your starts to all of your, your, your cardio base. And then the last one would be a talk test where we talk about VT one and VT two. Now VT one stands for ventilatory threshold one, which I think we've talked about previously. This is again, if your person is going to do the talk test, they should, they're going to build up to a point on their talk test where once it becomes uncomfortable and they start going incremental, I'll go one to th one to three minutes in stages. What you would do is keep going through those stages, you know, for one to three minutes. And then at the end of each stage, how are you feeling? If they feel good, keep moving to the next stage, which goes up a little bit harder until they can no longer keep that talk to them. And then that would be where they would go into VT2. VT2 is going to be where you have an issue with them, where not an issue, but where you can no longer hear um, their, where basically your, their heart rate is going to be the dictator. And if they have a predetermined pace, they're going to try to keep that for 20 minutes and see what they get at that point. Okay. And from there, like it says here, you calculate your average heart rate for five minutes time. 95% will give you your beats per minute rate. And at that point you'd be able to see where they were and how to improve from there. So again, first step in the health, wellness and fitness assessment category. And we will continue on this with chapter 12 and, and move on to our performance base. So Thanks again for listening and we will talk soon.